Hi, and welcome to this presentation on using text-dependent analysis in the classroom. Uh, I'm Deb Rogge, and we are going to specifically talk about um, various text structures which uh, really assist um, students as they do text-dependent analysis of their reading as they do close reading. The AQUES tenets that we're going to address today are assessment and educator effectiveness. And our learning goals are for today are to review what constitutes text dependent and to learn strategies to strengthen student skills in text dependent activities and to understand the basic principles of text dependent analysis, multiple choice, short answer, and full-length writings. So you may be asking the question, uh, why does this matter to me? Well, the goals for our students when we're considering text-dependent items or close reading and text-dependent analysis is the fact that right now in this very moment, we want our students to have a deeper comprehension of, of passage what they're actually reading. We want them to have a deeper understanding of the structure of the modes that they read, whether it be informational or it be personal narrative or it would be of any other of the uh, modes that are available for uh, students to be reading and using. Uh, we want them to have deeper writing in response to the passage and the questioning that uh, is taking place. We want our students to be able to actually dig into the passage. We want uh, them to have the learning of the skills on how to approach text and various forms of text. And then also we want to make sure that our students are uh, being taught using the 2014 Nebraska English Language Arts College and Career Readiness Standards so that they truly are to, ready to be able to move into their future. Uh, in the future, which is right here uh, in, our, in our classroom, we want our students to be able to interact with text to a much deeper understanding rather than just taking it face level, rather than just regurgitating. And we want them to be able to re respond with confidence to the comprehension items on the Nebraska State Assessment. So you might be asking yourself, what are text-dependent quest questions and why are we so concerned about them? Well, text-dependent questions are the questions we ask when we are reading closely. Um, they can only be answered with evidence from the text and they don't depend on students having any other experiences or any other knowledge. Uh, they have to gain all of that experience and the knowledge from the evidence in the text that they're reading. And it also requires them to read the text, not to actually skim the text or to uh, uh, cause that, to read the cliff notes or whatever else might be there in order to, as a shortcut. But they have to actually read that piece of text. Um, you can have text-dependent questions which are literal. In other words, they look for, um, a, you're, you're checking for that understanding within there, but they have to go back into the text in order to get them. But text-dependent questions uh, also can involve the students to have to analyze, th synthesize, or even evaluate uh, based upon what they learned from the text. Now, these text-dependent questions can focus on small amounts of text or portions of the text, text or the whole entire passage. So uh, students have, again, there's a call to why students have to have read the uh, passage. Now, they can take many forms. They can take multiple choice, short answer, or essay. In, uh, to the student. So there are some strategies that you can do for skill building uh, in answering text dependent uh, items or questions. And I'm going to share with you a few things that you can do in your classroom. Um, you might be asking why do we have to have 
uh, writing foundational skills in order to be able to answer text-dependent items. Well, we want to make sure that in the, if the student is truly understands how to respond in writing uh, or in thinking to a text-dependent question, that there's enough space available within their working memory to plan and compose and to edit uh, and revise any product that they might create in order to re respond to the question. Um, the only way, the only way for writers to get better about writing in any type of uh, type of writing is to write better sentences. And the other thing that has to happen besides writing better sentences, you have to have students write often not just big, long writing seldom. In other words, the big uh, research paper that's due at the end of the uh, semester or the quarter, while they have a purpose, they're only one piece of writing that the students do. If the student does some form of writing daily or almost daily within the uh, classroom, plus other longer and shorter writings uh, frequently, they will have... Uh, honed their skills far more sharply, and they're able to respond to text-dependent questions far with far more confidence and accuracy. So the bottom line is that our learning goal uh, for all of this is that we want to help students improve their text-dependent analysis writing by writing better sentences. You write a better sentence, you're going to be more successful at TDA writing. So how are we going to do that? I have uh, isolated uh, four different construction strategies that I'm going to take you through, and I'm going to give you the who, what, when, where, how of them, and then uh, give you some other resources in order to uh, be able to implement these within your classroom. We're going to look at these five specific right here, sentence expanding, sentence combining, sentence frames, sentence starters for citing effort, evidence, and then also sentence transitions that can be used in the student's writing. So we are going to start with sentence expansion. And we, there actually is a strategy that you can use that's identified on the right side of this, uh, of this slide. And first of all, you introduce a short sentence that is grammatically correct in capitalization, punctuation, and grammar. Then you model how to add to the sentence using different parts of, of speech, like prepositional phrases, uh, adverb phrases, um, uh, transition words, all of those kinds of things, all the while making sure that this that you and your demonstration and your students when they're doing it are using appropriate capitalization and punctuation as they expand this sentence. The third step would be to have students provide suggestions for different parts of speech to add to that sentence. In other words, have them actually uh, help you create this expanded sentence. It's not until after you, I do what I've done in steps one and two, and then in step three where I have the students, we work together in guided practice, before I have students do step four, which is work independently uh, or in pairs to expand sentences. I have to be honest with you that in step two, when I'm doing that guided practice, that's when I prefer to have students work in pairs to expand sentences before I have them work independently on their own. I strongly believe that they need the scaffolding uh, of uh, pairs and peer review and peer coaching and then my uh, continued guidance in order to be successful when they work independently. So when you've done step four, uh, it's important that that the students share their expanded sentence in small groups and get that feedback. We we need to have that feedback. The, the issue is is that while you may give the students this that are, uh, the same short sentence and the same information on the expanded, um, we need to make sure that the students understand understand 
that that they uh, have to have that feedback. And not every sentence is going to sound exactly the same, and not every sentence is going to be um, it's going to be uh, presented the same. So here's an example. So here's the short sentence. It's simply the Battle of New Orleans was won. So then I have three more facts that I use with uh, this uh, to expand this particular short sentence. Uh, Andrew Jackson, Jackson and his American forces, January 8th, 1815, and wanted to keep the British from seizing New Orleans and the Louisiana Purchase. Okay. So we weave all of those together and, and get them working uh, into one expanded sentence. This is what that expanded sentence might look like. On January 18, 1815, Andrew Jackson and his American forces won the Battle of New Orleans, therefore effectively preventing the British from seizing New Orleans and the vast Louisiana Purchase. So you can see how I took that short initial sentence, added those three other uh, phrases, and weaved them into one more interested, interesting, more depth-diving uh, sentence about Andrew Jackson and the American forces and the Battle of New Orleans. Okay, so uh, one that you might give to your students might be like this. And this is a form where you would actually work with your students. This goes back to right here in um, step three where you have students provide suggestions for different parts of speech and to add to the sentence. So here we have, uh, we're going to expand the sentence, plants need sunlight. Uh, we need to select uh, the, any of the following uh, question words, which might be who, what, when, where, uh, why, and or how. Um, and then, then the short stems that we might add behind in order to be able to uh, expand this sentence. So then down below, having had given the students all of this information, you then expand this, have them write the expanded sentence, and I would start again with pairs before I went to individuals. Then I would have my students of pairs, I would have like three sets of pairs come together and share their sentences, and then I would go ahead and open it up to the large group and have them all share their expand, have not all of them, but a select group of them share their uh, expanded sentence. They need to hear multiple ways that things can be uh, can be expanded. How sentences can be expanded. There is no any one formula, but we can teach them a process uh, in order to get a an expanded product. Another uh, strategy you can use is sentence combining. Um, there's where you choose two or more sentences for combining and then you as a teacher again remember in step two you always model 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 um, you combine the sentences using several examples and here it says with older students introduce moving deleting and adding words or parts in other words putting it into a different little type of an order in an organization so uh, step three asks you to have the students rate the quality of the new sentence and uh, provide alternatives to that new sentence uh, in order to combine it in a, a new or a different way, but the information that it shares is the same. And then have that very, very important discussion about which sentences sound better and why they sound better. So... Step four encourages you to have the students work in pairs and create several new possibilities. And then, of course, do that rating of their quality of their new sentences. So this is, this is a, uh, so let's see what this looks like is what I really want to get to right here. So, for example, let's look at, there's a, the starting sentence of cell phones are banned. 
And then we want to add they're banned in our school. And we want to add the idea that cell phones cause distractions and the idea that distractions are to learning. So if we take those that sentence and those three other sentences and combine them into one, it can look like this. And it says cell phones are banned in our school because they cause distractions to learning. Now, as you can see up above, each part, uh, important part, or each a piece of each one of the sentences is what I mean, was combined into create this far more interesting sentence rather than these four short, very sing-song sentences. Every idea or every key idea of each one of these sentences are captured in this one uh, combined sentence. So if you were working with your students, this would be a sample that you would, would and could use. Now the starting again is 11 is a prime number. Then we're going to add um, the idea that 13 is a prime number, and we're going to add prime numbers have only two factors, and the factors are one and the number itself. So then we would ask our students in pairs, remember, to write a combined sentence about um, the prime number 11 and the prime number 13. And once they've written one, we ask them to write it in two to three other ways using these particular ideas but causing this sentence to to have a different uh, weaving each each time they uh, uh, do their sample and then remember the fourth step is for that to have them share that with other students so again I would have uh, pairs of two uh, get into a group with two other sets of two and between the six of them they would share their sentences and then also don't forget to have them rank as to which sentence they feel is the the best combining on on down to uh, the combining that they don't feel quite as strong as what the the uh, first one is that they had chosen then we're going to talk about sentence frame Sentence frame is not cheating. Sentence framing is giving students a, a model to use uh, in order to be able to complete, to, to add information and have a complete sentence or a complete thought. Um, ultimately, when they've used, used the sentence frames, they they actually construct their own sentences using them. But these frames give them the scaffolding that they need to have in order to be able to uh, support their thinking and their writing. So once they have written a sentence frame, and I would always, again, start in pairs before I would work into independent work. And then I would have them share them with their peers. And they need to have that high level discussion of uh, discussing their word choice. Now remember, you need to model all of this before you ever turn your students loose, even in pairs work. And you need to hold those kinds of conversations with your students, um, with your students through one, two, three, and four, as those steps go over and over again before you turn them loose, even in pairs, or to independence, because when it gets down here to um, uh, idea five, it says that you need to fade the use of the frames um, during instruction until the students can write their sentences independently. So this is what sentence framing, uh, sentence frames actually look like. So if we're doing a compare and a contrast, this is a frame that we would use. Blank and blank are similar because they both, and then as you know, the dot, dot, dot would be where the student would tell how, how uh, blank one and blank two are similar because we would have that. And then we can say there are several major differences between blank and blank. The most notable is and then we can, we can put that, what is that most notable difference? So when we use these sentence frames, it helps students in order to be able to 
create order and create a uh, sense and knowledge out of their writing so that it makes sense, so that they have that. If you notice in the second uh, section of uh, compare and contrast, it says blank and blank are similar in, enough, in a number of ways. First, they both, another critical similarity, an equally important similarity. Finally, then, notice how each of the four phrases under the initial frame, those framing framings all have transitions within them. This is a great way to teach students how to, how to incorporate and how to appropriately use transitions. The same happens uh, at the bottom of the page. Here we have uh, we have we have uh, base statements with uh, frames within them, and then we also have those transitions that help. If we know how to do a compare and contrast and have the appropriate uh, transitions within that, it makes writing more automatic. And remember, that's one of our goals: is to work towards automaticity. So here we have, if we're summarizing informational text, what we might ask our students to do. So we provide this frame for our students. And again, we model, model, model with our students. And then we ask them to work together. And then we ask them to work independently so that they can do, uh, so that they can complete this with success. And it becomes automatic. At the bottom of this slide, we have an explanation or a why frame. Um, here we have a process frame. And uh, for all of you that are wondering how to write in your mathematics class, here's a problem solution, which is specifically uh, pointed towards mathematics. But this can be used also when your students are uh, uh, doing a... Uh, science experiment and they need to uh, do a, I'm going to call it a, a report as to their actions. They had a problem and they had to solve it within their science experiment. This frame can also be used here. And here uh, we work with our students on looking at graphs and graphics and uh, all kinds of non uh, of, of non-literary texts. So here we are is here is an analysis of a graphic so that gives you a sentence frame to help your students work through uh, so how do we write about when we're looking at a graph or when we're looking at some uh, uh, for instance, if we're looking at the sports statistics and all of those kinds of things. so here here we are looking within that. so, we have um, sentence frames. Uh, here's for an argument. There's two examples of how to uh, do a frame for, with your students for arguments. Uh, here's opinion. And then uh, remember that a sentence frame can be very short and direct and to the point. The last uh, frame I'm going to share with you is about an exit ticket. In other words, the students share about what they learned. And I think that that is a real important that again this goes back to the idea that students write short bursts frequently rather than long writings seldom so if you were going to uh, help your students improve their writing skills here's a sentence frame that you could write to in order to uh, weave or implement or make known your commitment to improving your students' writing skills. So here we have all of these starters with the blank where you would complete them. So that's, that's a practice and we can do those with our students as well. Um, one of the most important things we have to do when we're doing a reading a passage and then we're writing to that passage, we always have to cite our evidence. Now, the document over here to the right is a, um, it's a page that I have in the teaching resources that are available to you. If you saw the link uh, on, the, um, on, on the webinar page when you clicked, this particular sheet is there 
for you to use with your students. Notice that it says, uh, it gives various citing evidences. It says, according to the text, um, on page so-and-so it said, in paragraph so-and-so it said, um, the author said blah, which means um, the author wrote it all. You, when you cite text in a TDA, uh, we already know that you're speaking to a particular passage or passages. So you don't need to do the formal APA citing in that particular case. That stays only with the research paper. But if you're going to cite when you're doing a TDA writing, these are appropriate ways in which to cite evidence. And last but not least, uh, then we're going to talk a little bit about sentence transitions. Here I have on the right side again our uh, sentence transition words. And the word in red is uh, when you want to add something to your writing. Uh, this, these are other transition words that you can use and find. Like uh, furthermore, uh, also in the second place, and again, so we have comparison ones, we have contrast ones, summary, time, place, purpose, and many other uh, others. So if you present and work with your students on, present them with this transition words document, they should have it in their writing file, just as much as they should have the citing evidence document. They need to have these so that they can pull them out when they're writing for you in their short bursts. So when it comes to uh, doing uh, an examination, why they're able to pull them up from their long-term memory so they can use them right away. Also, when you're working with your students by modeling for them, Get yours out. Show them how you're using this, how you're making those decisions. Please make sure that you're talking through your thinking so that the students know what they're looking for and how they're doing that and why they're doing what they're doing. And that it that the words don't just happen on the page, but there's actually a thought process that takes place. So we just very quickly went through sentence construction strategies. Uh, these were the strategies that we examined, sentence expanding, sentence combining, sentence frames, sentence starters for citing evidence, and sentence transitions. Um, I really want you to uh, practice, practice, practice with your students. It's very, very important. The more the more practice they have, the more guided learning they have, the more feedback they have about their writing, the better writers they will be, and the more confident writers they will be, and the more you will be confident about their ability to write. So I thank you for being with me, and I wish you happy TDA writing.